Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Chodesh Tov Mborach. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today, deluxe breakfast in the Class today, super deluxe breakfast in the Class today. It's dedicated in loving memory, Liluni Shmatem, Rafael Alea Devorah Bat Avi Gaila Shalom, and Sammy Sutton's father, Moshe Ben Adel Shalom, sponsored by Avi Gross. Um, I don't see the other, uh, where is he? Where's Shai? I don't see the other one. Do you want to you give it to me? You know what I'm saying you want to you want to give me the the dedication of the words. Who is who is it uh, to? And also a mabruka mazal tov to Ladi and Jensen Mishan on the on their marriage, uh, sponsored by the entire flu crew. Yishtabach shemo, Hashem should bless the the flu crew. Okay, breakfast in the class is also sponsored in honor of Rosh Chodesh in sincere appreciation to Rabbi Farhi and the Kehila for including me in your uplifting Minyanim and special community. Sponsored by David Cohen. Where's David? Is he, did he go yet? David Cohen, actually, I learned with when I was in high school. Uh, I was a, he was a, a guy I was paired with when I was in Edison. Breakfast of the class also dedicated in celebration. Oh! In celebration of the wedding of Lottie and Jensen Mishan. Sponsored by the Fluke Room. I didn't see it there. Uh, also, sponsored by Leila and Akiva Raskin. Dedicated in celebration of the birth of their son and in celebration of the birth of their nephew to Karen and Simon Shochet. Mabruk Mazaltov, Mabruk Mazaltov. Breakfast in the class also dedicated in honor of, the ha- of a happy birthday to my brother, Arya Hurizadeh. Where is he, Arya? There he is. From his sister, Sheba, Ad Me'ave Esrim. Uh, and also in honor of Etan Chedvad, whose Hebrew birthday is this Shabbat, Pashat she- Pleh Shabbat, Pashat Shelach, dedicated by his father, Afshin Chedvat. And lastly, a dedicated loving memory of Joseph Kezri, Lava Shalom, Lulun Shmad Yosef Ben Rachel, sponsored by his loving sons Gabby and Jimmy Kezri. My friends, I would like to, if I could, um, take you on a little bit of a side journey in the week of Parashat Korach. You know, Parashat Korach, I just want everyone to know that's construction going on next door. That's not uh, me having body movement, bowel movements, okay? <laughs> you know, over here we can hear on the thing, they think, what's going on, Rabbi Fari? Okay, fine. Rabbi Tai. I would like to take you on a side journey. You know, we're familiar, everybody, with the idea of Korach uh, being a parasha where we discuss uh, machloket, fighting, disagreements, the tearing apart of a community, etc., etc. However, there are many other lessons that we learn surrounding this great story, the story of Korach. And I'd like to share just one of these stories, just one of these ideas. But in order to do so, if I can, allow me to back up for just one minute and describe to you something that we see in this week's parasha. You know, the Torah tells us that the two women in, the, in this parasha actually uh, are more influential in the outcome of the story that we read than their husbands themselves. Korach's wife, when Korach comes home and he's uh, shaved as a Levi, his wife says to him, what, they're making fun of you? They shaved your hair. Are you going to stand for this? I can't believe it. Look at what you've done. Look at what they've done. You really should take down the whole thing. She burns the whole house to the ground. And on her, the Gemara quotes the Pasuk, Ve'ivelet biyadea terasena. A wicked wife could with her own hands destroy the home. And then there's another woman in the parasha, who the wife of On Ben Pelet, Mrs. OBP, right? What does she do? She realizes that her husband is in way over his head. She realizes that he's fallen in with the gang. He's about to stand up to Moshe Rabenu, and the results are going to be disastrous. So what does she say to her husband? She says, what difference does this make to you? If Korach wins, who are you? A student. Moshe wins, who are you? A student. Your situation does not change materially. So why are you getting involved in this fight? It has nothing to do with you. Okay? On her, the Gemara says... Chachmot nashim banta beta, the wisdom of a woman, of women, banta beta, builds the house. So we have one wife, what does she do when her husband comes home, talking of revolution, talking of rebellion? She settles him down, she gives him a meal, she says, that, he says, but I told him I'm coming. She says, don't worry about it, leave it to me, your dinner is ready. She serves him a beautiful dinner, she serves him wine, she gets him drunk, she carries him, she puts him in his bed, Okay? Wild Gemara, okay? My friends, what is the wisdom in what On Ben Pelet's wife says to him? 
She tells him, either way, there's no benefit. Why would you do this? Could you imagine as an example, if someone says to you, look, here's a product. I think it's a good idea for you to buy it. It's a toaster oven. You say to the guy, I looked up online. In the reviews it says, it bursts into flames if you put cheese in it. <laughs> right? So I don't want to buy it. How about if the guy tells, look, I, I, it's on sale. <laughs> you say, of course it's on sale. Already burned down three houses. Right? Does anyone want to buy something? Does anyone want to invest in something that's going to harm them? That, that they have no upside from? There's no benefit for? Of course not. So on Ben Pellet, what she says to her husband is not wise, it's obvious. So why do we say about On Ben Pellet's wife, Chachmot Nashim Ben Tabeta? What's the wisdom in his wife? What is going on over here? And the Sifre Musar are all busy with answering this question. But I'd like to, for today, take one approach with all of you because it is Rosh Chodesh. You know, I always have a funny feeling when it comes to Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. Because on the 17th day of Rosh Chodesh Tammuz begins a period of mourning known as the three weeks. The days of Ben Amitzarim, between the straits. From that time, it's a time of mini Avelut leading up to the the nine days, the Shavua Shechalbo, and Tisha B'Av itself. But my friends, half of the month of Tammuz is just summer vacation. 16 days of Tammuz, we party hard. On the 17th day, what happens? Shiva Sabbath Tammuz. I've always thought that it's so interesting that we have a month where half of the month it's positive, it's beautiful, it's enjoyable, it's vacation. And half of the month is tsar, it is mourning, it is sadness. And the reason why I think that's so important is because I think every Rosh Chodesh Tammuz, the Rosh Chodesh itself offers us a choice. And it asks us, what kind of month do you want to have? We know that fixing the problem which caused the destruction of the temple, which causes us to stay in Galut, is not all that complicated. It involves Sinat Chinam, the hatred between a uh, Jew and his fellow Jew. And in guise of that, we're offered an opportunity to fix it, to leave this month and not have it be a terrible month. And the choice effectively that Rosh Chodesh Tammuz gives us is, what kind of month do you want to have? I'm reminded of the words of Rav Galinsky. Rav Galinsky was a, a, great, a great orator, fantastic storyteller, wonderful, a sense of humor. He was always very positive. Anyway, so his kids came to him and they asked him, you know, Abba, how is it that you're always so positive? You always see the glass is half full. Rav Galinsky was very short, maybe four foot, four foot something. And he said to his kids, he said, you know why I always see the glass half full? He said, I'm so short, I only see the bottom of the glass. I can't see the part of the glass that's empty, okay? So I only see the glass half, I always see the glass is, is half full. You know, but what's interesting to me is that although this is a joke, there's a tremendous depth to this comment. You know, when you're very tall and you're standing tall, what do you see when you look down? You see the top half of the glass. So a person who's standing tall with gava, with ego, what are they always noticing? Everything that they don't have, everything that they didn't get person who has humility recognizes that he's not God's gift to mankind. He's a regular guy, flesh and blood like everybody else. In that moment, he appreciates the things that he has in common with everybody else. A person with ego only appreciates things that nobody else has. So if you're making a living, but it's the same living as the majority of the world, you're like, ah, I'm a failure. I'm a failure. When am I a success? When I'm making more than everybody else. When I enter into that quarter of a percent, you know, of a 0 .001 percentile, that's how I need to be. Unless I'm there breathing in that rarefied air, I'm a loser and I'm a failure. My friends, someone once came to Rabbi Victor Miller, I think it was his grandchildren, and they brought him a glass half full, half empty, because they wanted to, because he had very wise sayings about Victor Miller. And they brought him the glass and they said, Grandpa, is the glass half full or half empty? 
He said, half full, half empty. The glass is totally full. Half with water and half with air. But the glass is totally full. What's interesting to me is that what is more required, chiyuni, for a person to live? Air or water? You can live without water for a little while. If you stop breathing for three minutes, four minutes, you're dead. You don't need to take a drink every three minutes. So you're looking at the part of the glass that has air in it, and what are you saying? Half empty. And you're looking at the thing that you need less, and that you're calling half full. We fill our cups, my friends, this time. I just want to share this idea. We fill our cups sometimes with things that we need less than the things that are important. You might have a great family and a great wife, a great husband, a great job, a great spiritual life. You might have great friends. I don't know what you have or what you don't have. But everybody has things that are required to live a happy life. But we're busy looking at what we don't have and trying to feel, so to speak, that we deserve more and therefore we live in a month of mourning. When meanwhile, Tammuz offers us are the opportunity. So if you want to be able to uh, love Jews instead of hate Jews, recognize that half of Tammuz is good, half of it's bad. Even if the, the, your friends did half good, half, is there something that they did that was good? Is there something about them that, is, that you could respect, that you could uh, cherish, that you could appreciate? So we're given that choice. And the, the question whether or not we want to destroy our own world is really up to us. Two people are described in Chazal as being the richest men that ever lived. One is Haman and one is Korach. And it is wild to think that the one thing that the two richest men who ever lived shared in common is that they were not happy with what they had and focused on what they did not have. Says Haman, It's not worth anything if Mordechai is not bowing to me. What should his wife have said? Dib! You have me. He had over 200 children. You have an army of kids. You're the most powerful man in all the kingdom. Walk through the street, everyone is bowing. It's not enough. What's wrong with you? You see this? It's such a powerful concept as it unfolds in front of us. Korach is not only rich, not only is he a Levi, not only is he described as Pikeach, as being incredibly wise, not only is he charismatic, dynamic, he's able to bring and, and get Am Yisrael rallied around one thing. Korach, my friends, our rabbi tells us, was also a Navi. Korach, ki pikeach haya, ma ra'al ishtutzu. What made him go nuts? Eno hit ato. Our rabbi say his eye, it tricked him because he saw in the nevu'ah that coming out of him is going to be Shmuel Navi who's considered like Moshe and Aaron, he thought, how could I have a great-grandson like that if I'm not right? God wouldn't reward me that way. Not realizing that it was his children, did Teshuvah, who went away from his side of the Machloket to the other side, to Moshe, that that's what caused that, he, that they merited to have such a child. But my friends, let's not lose sight of the fact that Korach just had a prophecy of who his grandson was going to be. That means that Korach is a Navi. None of this is enough On Ben Pelet's wife serves him a meal. But why, my friends, does she serve him a meal? What's her primary objective? She wants to make sure he doesn't go to the rally. What does she need to do? Get him drunk. That's what she did, right? Why does she serve him any food? Why does Chazal need to tell us that she served him food? The answer, my friends, is that On Ben Pelet's wife understood something very, very deep. She understood something incredible. And in this lies the wisdom of On Ben Pelet's wife. And this wisdom is accessible to all of us. I want to share this concept. I want to share this concept by means of an incredible story. A painful, a traumatic, a tragic story. There were two friends living in Eretz Israel, Rabbi Abba Grossbard and Rav Kahanaman, the Panavichirov. Two great tzaddikim, two great rabbis. And they shared one terrible thing in common. Both of them lost their wife and all their children in the Holocaust. You see, Rabbi Abba and Rav Kahanaman, both of their wives, the Rabbaniot, they were in Israel at the time, their wives and their children were traveling together to the train. 
And on their way to, to the train that was going to save their lives, they realized halfway to the train station that they had forgotten the tickets, the train tickets at home. They were forced to turn around and go back home to get the tickets. By the time they went back, got the tickets, arrived at the train station, they missed the train. And Barminan, they were forced onto a different train, a train that took them to the gas chambers to their deaths. Leaving the train tickets at home was the death sentence to both of their families. Rabbi Abba, when he found out, he was, treme- he was torn apart. And he made a comment. And his comment is so interesting. It's so painful. He said, if only my wife had not lost her menuchat nefesh had not lost her sense of calm, her sense of serenity, of zen, in this terrible, terrible time, she would not have forgotten the tickets and my family would still be alive. This idea, he was mourning with this idea, the loss of his wife and children. But he was saying, is the reason why she could forget the only thing that she really needed. Anything else is expendable. The only thing she needed was those tickets. And she forgot them at home. It was because so much was on the line, so much was happening. She got lost. She lost her calm, her equilibrium, her serenity. I mean, she can't be blamed for that. That's not what he was saying. But he was saying as if she had maintained that, that his family would still be alive. This broke Rav Abba's heart. He died only a couple of years after a broken-hearted man. But what's so interesting to me is that Rav Kahaneman carried on to rebuild the most prestigious yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, the yeshiva of Panovich. He carried on and nursed back to health orphans that came from the Shoah that lived there. He considered all of them his children, all the boys, all the girls. He married them off. He worried for them to get them pillows and blankets and, and towels, anything that they needed. He literally brought them back to life. He married again and built a new family. How could two people who go through the same story have such remarkably different outcomes? My friends, I think part of it is the comment that Rabbi Abba made himself. A person could live looking at everything that they've lost. And if a person lives with the pain and the suffering and the mourning of what they lost, they cannot move on. In Lot's story, we read about the fact that God says, I'm going to save you from the city. Just don't look back. Lot's wife looks back. Now, there's an interesting concept. The concept says, you know, You know, does it say in the Torah that the angels tell her, you're going to turn into a pillar of salt? Did the angels tell her that? They said, don't look back. But they didn't describe what the punishment was going to be. And is it such a sin for her to look over her shoulder that it should carry the death penalty? Why, was, why place such a strong premium on, on a twist of the neck? And the answer, my friends, is that when devastation is in your rearview mirror, looking back will kill you. If Shedom and Amora is Gafrit Vamelach, it's sulfur and salt, then looking back at that destruction brings the sulfur and salt to you. If you have an infestation in your house of moths and you decide, you know what? I'm sick of this. I can't get rid of them. I'm going to move to a new house. But you pack your clothing. What happens to the moths? They go with you to your next house and to the next apartment and to the next apartment. You can't run away from baggage that you're still carrying. So if you look over your shoulder, God says to to Lord's wife, you're going to be living in the salt. It's interesting that language. It doesn't say that she was punished and, and Hashem got angry and he turned her. It says, and she became vatehi. It's the natural outcropping of a person living with that tsar, with that pain. Rav Kahneman, on the other hand, however pained, however sad, and however devastated he was, and he was, he thought to himself, if family is something that I love so much, let me rebuild family. If the communities and the Jewish nation that, that was, you know, disappeared in the smoke is so important to me, 
let me rebuild some of those communities. And that's what he did. But the minuchat ha-nefesh is what allows a person in a maelstrom, in a tornado, to just breathe and think. You know, you never think logically when you're emotional, when you're angry, when you're upset. Korach comes home, his wife gets him upset. He's so smart. But Korach's wisdom doesn't save him because he's so drawn into the narrative and the drama. My friends, with a sense of minuchat nefesh, it does not mean that bad things don't happen. It doesn't mean that you don't feel the pain of difficult circumstances. It means that with those difficult circumstances, I can still be present enough to figure out how to take the next step. And yes, there's a lot of screaming and shouting. And yes, I have to figure out what to pack in the luggage. And yes, I need to figure out if this one has their sandwich. But I'm not going to forget the tickets. Because that's the most important thing here. My friends, what's the most important thing in your life? What most important things are you losing? Are you forgetting? Because you're not maintaining minuchat hanefesh. One of the great lessons of this parasha is that the greatest wisdom is to allow for a space where wisdom matters. One of the things people need for minuchat hanefesh is time. You know, I, should, I was thinking about making an invention, an app that you can install on your phone. And you know what the app does? Very simple. But I think that my app would be priceless. It's worth billions of dollars. And here on the recording, I'm saying that it's my idea, so if anyone copies it, I'm suing you. You know what my, phone, you know what my app does? Any message you send, text message, any WhatsApp message, any social media message you send, it hits pause on sending it out for five minutes. Later iterations of my app, I'm going to introduce AI so it can tell if your message is pick up the paint, get me a sandwich, if it's innocent. But especially a message that has words of anger in it, words of accusation in it. Don't you wish you could get that email back? Do you agree my app is priceless? Someone's saying it exists, Shema Israel. Hold on, I'm going to need a few minutes to process that before I respond. <laughs> the time that it takes to calm things down and be able to respond properly, my friends, that is everything. The wisdom of On Ben Pelet's wife is therefore what? She makes him sit down to a meal. By the end of the meal already, there's maybe a conversation. And I wonder... Maybe the wine that she gave on Ben Pellet, maybe its purpose was not to get him drunk. Maybe its purpose was to get him happy. And once on Ben Pellet was drinking, because he has a beautiful wife who makes him wonderful food, he's got a nice cup of wine in his hand. Once he was happy, he was already happy to drink the wine to get drunk, to not have to go. He recognized that he has a loving family, that he's got around this table everything that he needs, and that in either scenario, he's not going to gain anything. What do I gain from this? Only wage haras, only stress, only anger. My friends, try during this week to instill in your life a sense of calm of minuchat nefesh. You hear news? Meh. Doesn't have to affect you. Terrible news about the stock market. All right. You know what? I've developed a line. And I love saying this line. And I say it all the time about many things. Yeah? I always say, someone tells me bad news. You know what I say? I say, the Jewish people has been through worse. Stock markets crashed. Jewish people have been through worse. Look at who was elected. The Jewish people have been through worse. Yeah? Your clothing got a moth infestation. The Jewish people have been through worse. And we've survived so many things. If you could respond to that, keep yourself calm. Don't react immediately. Understand that that's not the way to have a beneficial conversation with yourself about what to do, 
Menuchat nefesh. Someone says something gets you angry? No problem. The guy wants to get back to you. I, I feel that one of the things that the phone has done to us, it's a big challenge. There's something called a blue tick. What's a blue tick? A blue tick is when the other person knows that you read their message. Now that already exists in an email. You could get a read receipt, a read report. But in an email, just because someone read your email doesn't mean that you're expecting them to answer. If you read someone's WhatsApp message or text message and you get a blue tick and you don't respond in the speed of light, I see you read my message. I see it's blue tick. What's going on? You know what my family calls me? I'm the blue tick king. I read the message, I don't respond. Who says, just because I read your message, I'm obligated to respond right now? This idea, the speed of our lives, is creating an epidemic, not of corona, but of an inability to process information healthily. Because when you have to respond immediately, what are the odds? On the spot, off the cuff, you're going to make the right decision? Probably not. So you also, I'm welcoming you in. You can all be the blue tick kings along with me. I don't mind, uh, you know, it says normally we say, en malchut achat nogat bechavreta filu kemelo nima. You two people can't share the crown. I'm happy to share this crown. You read the message, you didn't respond. You're thinking about it. I don't know, I'm not sure. Let me think. Someone gets you angry. You want to respond? You want, no problem. Even tell yourself, I have the best, I'm going to tell them this. Fine, no problem. Tell you Yetzirah. We'll tell him that message. Write the message. No problem. Write it. Don't send it. Three minutes. Okay, I'm just wait. I'm just going to wait. Go ahead, send. Could you imagine you had that ability in, in your interpersonal relationships? Your kid lets you down. Your first reaction, boom, you killed him. If you waited three minutes and realized that if your goal here is that your kid should succeed, how is making him going to feel like a loser like a low yutzlach, how is that going to help your ultimate goal? You know what the answer is? I couldn't. I lost myself. I was so upset. Three minutes later, that's all it takes. A couple of minutes. Hashem should bless us. Hashem should bless us. Hashem should bless us. nefesh. Sometimes all it takes to build a home is the minuchat nefesh, the calm. Not everything needs you to get so excited. Not everything needs you to get so dramatic. Not everything is as important, as urgent, as problematic. You know, everything sometimes you read in a, you know, a publication. This is the worst thing that happened to the Jewish people. I remember once someone said, there was a Jewish music thing that came out. And he said this, and the rabbi said, this is the worst thing to happen to the Jewish people. He said about Mordechai and David, by the way. Worst thing to happen to the Jewish people since Uncle Moishi. I was like, if those are the tzarot of Am Yisrael, yirbu tzarot bi Yisrael. That's, Uncle Moishi is the worst thing. Mordechai ben David is the worst thing. A Yeresh Shamayim. You know, a Yeresh Shamayim, by the way, who when he goes to a concert and the concert is mixed, he refuses to sing and they're throwing things at him and he won't start until it separates. That's the worst thing to happen to Am Yisrael? A person with that level of Yerat Shamayim. You know, if everything is a disaster, I want to share with you one thing. You're trying to teach your kids. If everything is a disaster, nothing's a disaster. If everything is a problem, you know what your kids learned? Nothing is a problem. You just say that everything's a problem. Minuchat nefesh rabotai. A little bit of calm. Try and bring that into your life today. I, I, I'm, I'm a very, I have a big imagination. So one of the things I imagine all the time is I imagine music playing. Anyone have a big moment? I imagine background music playing. Just imagine, you know the music that you put on with the babbling brook? You know, when you're about to get a massage, da, na, na, you know, the water's, it's raining on the roof, you know, it's very loud. Imagine that music is playing when you're hearing some bad news, but the music like swells in and you hear like seagulls. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Take it down a couple notches. Anger, chaos, ta'ava, just take it down a couple. Stop, calm. Person does that, they'll realize that there's very few things that knocked them off their pedestal. My, there was a guy here, I'll end with this, there was a guy here in this, in this class, comes all the time, who told me a story about a friend of his who was one of the wealthiest men in the community. He had 700 people attending a wedding. 
something like 500 people attending a wedding, a getaway weekend in a beautiful castle, wherever he was, according to the wealth that he had. And everyone's there. It's the talk of the, the century. It's beautiful. Anyway, they're doing this wedding. Fantastic. The, uh, the Shabbat is in the, in the castle, and then the wedding's going to be on Sunday. On Sunday morning, the news broke that this man, something happened in his business. He went in one day, he went bankrupt. 500 guests at this, I don't know, 50, 20 million dollar wedding, whatever it is. And the guy who's doing the wedding lost all of his money on the day of the wedding. Everyone's talking in the hotel. I don't know what's going to be. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the man stands up, bangs on the table, says, can I get everyone's attention, please? He says, I had this morning however many hundreds of millions of dollars, and now I lost it. And I know everyone's talking about how sad it is that I lost this money. He says, but I want to tell you, I'm a survivor of the Holocaust. When I was running around alone, scared for my life, none of my family members are alive. Who could have imagined that I would have a family? Who could have imagined I would have survived? Who could have imagined I would have children? And tonight, one of those miracle children is getting married. Could we focus on the real simcha here? If that's not menuchat nefesh, I don't know what is. Hashem should bless us with the koach to be able to deal with anything that comes our way.